Welcome to everybody on the webinar today. It's Robert Bond with Janine and Hannah at Bristow's for our Legally Speaking range of webinars. And today we're going to be dealing with GDPR and processes. You can send in questions at any time using the question box for the webinar. Uh, we're going to be doing this for uh, one hour. Uh, and if uh, I can just move to the next slide. For those of you that don't know Bristow's, we're 125 lawyers based in London, but our clients include many of the world's leading most innovative companies, and we have a strong focus on technology-rich sectors. We're ranked number one for data protection in chambers and Legal 500 since the legal rankings began and we're best known for managing compliance programs and change programs in many of the world's largest companies. So just a brief overview of the three of us that are speaking today. Uh, many of you will know uh, me from previous webinars that we did at our previous law firm. Um, I've been doing data protection since the early 80s, and I'm joined today by Hannah Crowther, who's an associate in our department. Uh, she uh, manages lots of multinational um, and multi-jurisdictional compliance projects and has particularly been dealing with a number of binding corporate rules, but also deals with some of the more contentious issues, particularly around subject access requests and so on. And then we also have with us Janine Regan, who was with me at our previous firm. So again, many of you will know Janine from previous webinars. Janine, like Hannah, deals with cross-border compliance issues uh, in the data protection field. And as you can see from her bio, uh, covers many of the different industrial sectors uh, where data protection is a key issue. So today, uh, we're going to go First of all, back to basics, and I apologize in advance if I'm telling you things which you're already aware of, but we thought we would set the scene as to what the law says currently, uh, and then obviously we're going to move forward to the regime under the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, and we're going to look at the data processes liability under the current law and then under GDPR. And Hannah is going to be looking at those topics. And then Janine is going to look at uh, controller's obligations under the current law and under the new law. And then I'm going to finish off with some practical considerations uh, for processors and what they should anticipate in terms of the due diligence that may be done on them by controllers. And then whilst there are many different ways of transferring personal data safely like Privacy Shield and model contracts. I'm going to specifically talk about the notions of certifications or seals and also codes of conduct under GDPR. We always like to do some polling questions, many of you will know, um, and I'm going to ask Jaina if she could launch the first poll Please help us uh, by responding to it, and I'm just going to sum up uh, as we get the poll results uh, what your responses are. So um, we're just interested from the uh, audience today, are you primarily controller or are you a processor or are you both? And it doesn't surprise me as the percentages come through that the vast majority of you are both a controller as well as a processor, and that's not unusual in a multinational organization uh, where you are uh, at one point allowing your server to be used by one of your other affiliates, and obviously for every processor, they're likely to also be a controller if only in relation to HR, supplier, uh, and so on data. So. We're looking at about 65% of both, 23% uh, of you are saying controller, and only 12% class yourselves as a mere processor. So thank you for that. And Jaina, if we can have the second poll, please. Yes, 
So uh, we're looking percentage-wise. Well, okay. So in answer to our second poll, um, I, I was going to say I was pleasantly surprised to see that more than 50% were saying yes, but in fact that's just dropped slightly as you're answering it. I'm just going to give you a few more seconds to respond to that one. And in terms of the answers we've got, 42% saying yes, 23% saying no, and again, not surprisingly, uh, about 33, 34% of you say not sure. Okay, if we can close that poll, please, Jaina, and then open our final one. Are you planning to improve the due diligence that you do on uh, data processors? And we're hoping that um, after this webinar, if not right now, there is going to be a vast majority of you saying for sure uh, we are going to uh, change our approach to due diligence and so on in relation to processes. And Okay, well, I've got, it's not, I'm, I'm very pleased with this, 0% have said, no, we're not going to do anything else because we're already on top of all of this. 67% um, of you are saying, for sure, and the rest of you, 33%, are saying, well, I may do after this webinar. And it was not quite trick answers, um, but thank you for uh, those three polls and your answers. Um, so we'll close those uh, and we'll move on. Okay, so I'm going to do uh, back to basics for a few minutes. And as I say, uh, apologies if this is telling you things you already know. But as a general, uh, the data controller is the business that makes decisions in relation to data, um, the way in which the data is going to be collected, processed, and that may be alone or in conjunction with a joint controller, as opposed, of course, to the processor, which is any person or business that is engaged to carry out processing on behalf of the data controller. Personal data is any information that identifies a living individual from that data or from that data and other information that is reasonably likely to be in possession of the controller. And these definitions, by the way, as I'm going through them, are really unlikely to change under GDPR. And of course, the data subject is the individual that is subject to the processing activities. Again, under the current legislation, sensitive personal data is information that identifies racial or ethnic origin, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, physical or mental health conditions, sexual life, criminal or suspected criminal offenses. And remember that under GDPR, we do get some other special categories of data, such as children's data, uh, genetic and uh, biometric data, so those are new when GDPR comes in. And I always say that this, that the definition of processing, frankly, is any adjective you can think of that, it, that describes doing something with somebody's personal data. Uh, under the current regime, we talk about data protection authorities, the ICO, for example, in the UK, or GIODO in Poland or the CNIL in France. GDPR talks about supervisory authorities, but essentially it is the same regulatory bodies. Something that is not in the current law, although many data protection authorities, including our information commissioner and the Irish commissioner, uh, have suggested are a good risk management tool now, and certainly will be part of GDPR, is the concept of the privacy impact assessment, a risk management tool that effectively helps the business make a decision as to whether a new processing activity or a new use of personal data is going to adversely impact human rights or data protection rights of individuals. So, 
we are seeing a huge increase in businesses implementing privacy impact assessments now and they will be very much mandatory under the GDPR regime. Again, the principles that we currently have across the EU may see different phraseology under GDPR, a much more use of words like accountability and transparency, but essentially the eight principles we're used to here in the UK are fair and lawful processing, only using data for purposes for which you have permission, making sure that data is adequate, relevant, and not excessive, uh, up-to-date, processed for no longer than necessary, used in accordance with data subjects' rights, and then seven of the eight principles is around information security, whether technical or organizational. And then finally, of course, uh, the dreaded data transfer restrictions from the European Economic Area, that's the 28 EU member states plus Iceland, Norway and Liechtenstein, uh, to countries that are not deemed adequate. And as I say, we will come back and look briefly as we go through on how controllers and processors may need to rethink the contractual mechanisms, particularly around data transfers. And GDPR, as I say, rewords or rephrases this, but it's essentially the same. And my last slide on GDPR, I think, is no news to anybody in that we will have it by the 25th of May 2018. Um, it will, as a regulation, be in force instantly across each of the member states, and notwithstanding the UK and Brexit, we will have GDPR. There may, of course, be still some localizations, so I'm not sure that it will be entirely harmonized, and obviously GDPR has to dovetail into things like the e-privacy regulations that are under discussion and also the uh, NIST directive or Network Information Security Directive, which we may again just briefly touch on as we go through the course of these slides. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Hannah to look at data processor liability under current law uh, and then under GDPR. So, Hannah, over to you. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so, just on to my first slide, if I can... Sorry, technical. <laughs> ah, sorry, I'll, I'll point at Jaina whenever I want it to move. That's probably the easiest way. Um, so, the first thing, under the, new, under the current law, so the 1995 Directive in the UK, the 1998 Act, I suppose the, you know, the processors have no direct obligations at the moment, so everyone's been getting off quite lightly uh, for many years now. There is one slight exception, exception to that in some countries, and that's in relation to security obligations, uh, but that's not the case. In the UK, there are no direct statutory obligations on uh, processors. So that means that the only obligations uh, have been, up until now, imposed under the contract with the controller. There is an obligation on the controller to put in place a written uh, contract, and um, so you would then have those contractual obligations. And that contract had to stay, state that the processor will only act on the controller's instructions, and also contain a security obligation, um, in which would be to use appropriate technical and organizational security measures, and also to ensure the confidentiality of your, pers of your personnel. Um, and so, of course, because those are only contractual obligations and not statutory, uh, a processor at the moment will only have contractual liability to their customer, and that's it. They have uh, no chance of getting any fines from the ICO. They're not regulated by the ICO. And apart unless you were a particularly creative individual looking at sort of a tortious claim or something like that, no scope for any direct compensation claims either. Now, there's a little bracketed wording there, unless uh, you become a controller. And that is um, a, a slight point, just to, just to say that it's not the case that you can just run off and do whatever you like with the data and, oh, don't worry, my business model is I'm a processor, I'm fine. If you were to start acting outside the instructions of the controller, you would then be deemed to become a controller. And so then you would be fair game for the ICO or any other data protection authority. 
Um, and all of that meant in terms of liability that actually it's a common market position is becoming increasingly that a lot of processors, obviously not all of them, but a lot of are willing to accept unlimited liability for data protection. That's not that unusual as a negotiated market position because it's something that customers are pushing for more and more. And for so sometimes it feels like a bit of an easy win, an easy give for a data processor because you know you can have a contract which has a liability cap of two million quid, say whatever, and everyone is in a big hoo-ha about unlimited liability for data protection. But actually, in the UK, your maximum fine is five hundred thousand pounds. So is it really that much of a give to offer unlimited liability for data protection? Um, however, this is all about to change. So under the GDPR, processors will have direct statutory obligations. Now, a key thing to make clear right from the start, because I think people do get confused about this, is that they are not the same as the controller's obligations. And they are actually, this is much narrower in scope. So it's not suddenly the case that as a processor, you are responsible for having to go out and make sure you have the right consents or grounds for processing or given, you know, given notice or anything like that. The majority of the obligations are still on the controller because they're still the, the party that's decided what should be done with the data. However, you do have the, you will have as a processor all of the obligations set out there. So you have a direct statutory obligation to only process the data on the controller's instructions. You have a direct statutory obligation to make sure the security is appropriate, which is a particularly interesting one because of course, depending on what you know about the data, if you're a you know large cloud provider or something like that, it may be very difficult for you to assess whether those security obligations are appropriate for that data. So I think that's something which will perhaps come to you about trying to protect, mitigate against that in your contract. You have direct obligations in respect of your sub-processors, so to flow down the contractual terms that you have and to stand behind them, essentially, in terms of liability to the controller. Uh, again, data transfers. Now, the, I think because of the way that is um, stay, uh, expressed in the GDPR, my interpretation is that as a processor, you have an obligation for the transfers that you make, and the controller has the has the obligation for the transfers it makes. So it's a sort of party actively transferring the data. So I think it's a little bit unclear as to whether if you are a processor in the US, would you have an obligation in respect to data that you receive. I think I think it, it may not actually in practice make a difference, but I think that's a you know open question. Uh, breach reporting. So a processor is not expected to report directly a security breach to the data protection authority, but there is a direct obligation there to report without undue delay to your customer. Um, who knows what undue delay is, but I think that probably most a lot of customer controllers would be looking to put a, an hour put a time bounding on that. I think one kind of useful negotiation point is just to make it clear that the controller's breach reporting obligation starts within 72 hours of them becoming aware of it. So if you ever get, if you're a processor and you have controllers saying, oh well, we have to report within 72 hours, so you have to tell us within five minutes, that's you know not true because their, 70, their clock only starts ticking once the processor tells them. Um, they will have an obligation to appoint, a, a processor has an obligation to appoint a data protection officer if they meet the statutory conditions, which are the same as for a controller. So if you're processing sensitive personal data on a large scale or systematic monitoring on a large scale. Um, so and that, so if, if you're a particularly, maybe you're a processor that particularly targets uh, health, so the health sector or something like that, then you will know that you've got a lot of sensitive data in there. Um, and then finally, record keeping. So an obligation to keep records uh, in on, a, on a controller by controller basis of all the processing that you're doing. Um, so those are, those are your direct statutory obligations. And um, looking next at liability. So as I said, you, as you've got direct statutory obligations, you've then therefore got the potential for direct regulatory enforcement um, from whichever data protection authority has jurisdiction. Um, and there is scope for processes to have the one-stop shop. So that might only that might all flow through one DPA, or you know, or if you're established across the EU, or it might be you know, the only DPA where you are. Uh, 
the fines. So having gone from absolutely no possibility of fines, we're now looking at you know maximum 20 million or 4% of global turnover. I think I think you know that we're not going to look at those numbers to start with at least. I'm sure they will. I'm sure that the DPAs will want to show their teeth and really show the processors that actually you are within this regime now. So I'm sure we will see a fairly hefty fine at some point, but I, I mean, you know, I don't think the first one's going to be 4% of global turnover. Uh, for, for the first time, compensation for data subjects. Um, so that's something that to, to start thinking about as well. That is only to the extent that you're breaching the processor obligations. So it's not the case that you would be liable for something that the controller did. But there is this concept of joint liability in the GDPR, which is very, very interesting, which is that if you, if both the controller and the processor are responsible for something, so it's all gone horribly wrong because both of you, unfortunately, there, you know, mistakes happened, then the individual need only bring a claim against one of you, and then it's up to the processor or the controller, whichever one the data subject decided to bring the claim against, to then recover from the other party. So as if you're a particularly if you're a high profile processor or you were the one that was particularly in the media, you could end up having to pay out for all the breach and then recover that from your customer, which obviously in a contractual situation, particularly in a sales situation, could be very, very difficult. Now, the only, there's a slight difference between controller and processor risk there because the controller doesn't matter whether they were at fault, the data subject can always come to them. As a processor, a data subject can only bring a claim against you. You can only have to. You can only compensate. Be able to give any compensation if you were to some degree at fault. So you have you have to have breached the GDPR, but then you could be liable for the whole lot. And then of course there is still your contractual liability to your controller because um, as I'm going to go on to talk about the data processing agreement that still remains an obligation. You still have to have one, one of them in place. It's pretty prescriptive. And so if you breach that, you could still be liable to the controller, which also, of course, you've got a double risk there because you have this risk of your own pet potentially being able to have to pay out to a regulator, but then you also might have to compensate your controller if as a result of your breach, they suffered loss. And now moving on to talk about the contract um, and liability issues there. Now, as I mentioned, you still have to have this written contract in place. The GDPR is a bit agnostic as to whether it is the controller or the processor's responsibility. Essentially, it says a contract must be in place. So one is inclined to think that probably it will depend on whose paper it was. I mean, if you are putting out a standard form terms, if you're the processor, then I think you know, if that turned out to not be compliant with the GDPR, then I think ultimately the data protection authorities could hold you liable for that. Now, they might, in the first instance, I think, you know, if it's a very, as it's a highly negotiated agreement, then I think they would definitely put some responsibility on the controller. I think, you know, we, it's going to be very, very complicated if we start getting down to individual clauses which were heavily negotiated and therefore non-compliant or something. We, I'm not sure, you know, they might... Not sure how much people will, the regulators will get into that. But I think if you have standard terms and you're a processor, you would be responsible for making sure they were compliant. And it, it's not very, it's not a very pretty list of obligations, I'm afraid, if you're a processor. Um, it's very prescriptive. You have to give an audit right. You have to cooperate with the controller to help them. You have to return or delete the data. And I mentioned earlier the sub-processing. You have to give a contractual obligation to flow down the GDPR mandatory terms to your sub-processors. Now, if your sub-processors are outside of the GDPR regime altogether, some of, that, some of these might be difficult. And so at that point, you're trying to balance a contractual risk versus a regulatory risk. Because would you rather have a contract which you know from the outset you can't stand behind because you simply cannot flow down all of those obligations to your sub-processors? Or you simply can't offer a blanket on this on-site audit and accept the risk that your contract is non-compliant and so potentially you could face regulatory scrutiny for that. And so I think there's a bit of a balance to be had there and you know you need to get terms that are on the way but there may be some things where you take a view and you say you know what okay if a DPA was writing this they might not write it like that 
but at least I know that I'm not in breach from the outset. Um, just on to the next slide. So in practice, talking, we've talked about the risk. What what can you do in terms of the sort of live? What were we going to see in terms of liability clauses? Um, so I think we're going to see a move away from uncapped liability. I think that would be a pretty extra, I think that would be a significant risk for any um, data processor to accept uncapped liability under the GDPR when you could be facing, therefore, having to compensate someone for up to four percent of their global turnover. I mean. You know, I think most people's business would shut down pretty quickly in that case. Uh, but I also think that we might see more of a mutual situation because both parties are now exposed to each other's risk. And you can also see mutual indemnities happening there. And I mentioned that slightly oblique looking controller risk. And that's because both parties actually have quite a lot to the extent they can influence the other one's risk. Now, you're not going to be penalised for what the other party did because it's still, you know, any data protection authority is looking at your obligations and whether you breach them. But that doesn't mean that if a controller gives you data that they shouldn't have done, your risk doesn't go up because people are much more likely to bring a claim and the data protection authorities are perhaps much more likely to get interested and really start digging into you if the whole thing has blown up because of the actions of that controller. Because Yes, sure, you lost the data, but if you shouldn't have had the data in the first place, then it's all going to be a lot worse. So I think as a negotiating tool, it's quite helpful to be able to say, okay, I'll give you that indemnity, but you're going to have to give me one back. And that's also the case for warranties, mutual warranties saying, okay, well, I'm only going to say that this security is appropriate if you also say that it's appropriate because you know about the nature of the data. So I think we're going to see quite a lot more mutuality with both parties saying, you know what, if you, you know, if you expect me to stand behind all of this, you have to do the same. Um, and then just as a final point on liability, it's not, I think it's, the, you know, there's very, very little scope to limit your liability to data subjects. You're not in a direct contract with them. And I think it's, quest, you know, e even if you were through some other mechanism, I think it's going to be pretty hard to have that stand up to any consumer challenges as well. Um, so now I think I'm handing it over to Janine. Thank you, Hannah. Okay, so Hannah has already explained that under the Data Protection Act, the legal responsibilities for compliance really fall on the controller, not the processors. And as she said, data processors, generally speaking, don't have obligations under data protection law. And therefore, if there is a breach, it's going to be the data controller who's on the hook to the data protection authority, not the data processor. And fines aside, the reputational damage that can occur if there is a breach caused by a processor can be incredibly damaging. And I think the recent actions that the ICO here in the UK has taken against charities who have outsourced their marketing activities to third party providers who've been incredibly aggressive with those marketing activities um, has been have been very poignant. The charities have ended up on the front pages of the tabloid newspapers and it's been very damaging to their reputations indeed. Now over the years I've found that uh, particularly when acting for small to medium-sized enterprises, it's actually quite difficult to negotiate with some data processors on the data protection provisions in the agreement and indemnities as well, particularly with the large, uh, larger suppliers in the US. But in recent times, I've really seen quite a distinct shift. Data processors, particularly the big suppliers, now have their own standard data processing agreements. They're offering up the standard contractual clauses for their European customers. And generally, they have a much better understanding, I feel, of EU data protection law requirements. Um, and they're indeed hiring lots of people who know all about this and can understand where their customers, their data controllers, come from. Now, I suspect that GDPR does have quite a lot to do with this, and as Hannah mentioned, data processors are going to have their own statutory data protection obligations and liabilities to worry about, and therefore I really think it's going to be much more in the interest of the data processors to make sure 
that the data processing agreements properly align responsibilities between the parties. However, this doesn't mean that there aren't areas of contention, and Hannah has already pointed out some of the difficult areas uh, of the regulation that prescribe what the contract must contain between controllers and processors. I'm just going to expand on those a little bit further. So first, the regulation states that the data controllers should have control over the data processor's use of subprocessors. The data processor will have to obtain the consent of the controller about the use of subprocessors. However, it will be possible to build in a general consent, but this will still give the uh, controller the opportunity to object if they don't like the look of the new processor. And I think the issue here and the ambiguity is around the basis on which controllers are able to object and the types of solutions to offer in the event that they do object. And I really think that it's very crucial pre-contract to have these discussions about the use of subprocessors, about the use of subcontractors, and to make sure that the procedure for objecting and what's going to happen in that event is documented in the agreement. Another issue that I've come across is around breach notification. Um, as Hannah said, um, data processors have to notify the controller without undue delay, but of course controllers really want to have an exact time frame. They want to know that they're going to be notified within a specific period, but a lot of data processors are very keen that they don't go any further than they absolutely have to under the GDPR. And I think a lot of wrangling around the time frame for breach notification. And I do think we need a bit more clarity from perhaps Article 29 about what exactly is meant by without due delays, all a little bit too subjective to me. Next is around audit and demonstrating compliance. Now, for practical reasons, suppliers who have thousands and thousands of customers, they of course don't want to be granting access to each and every customer to come on site with a couple of days notice and have um, a snoop about. But the GDPR is very clear that processes must allow for and contribute to audits, including inspections, they say, conducted by controllers or an auditor mandated by the controller. Now, in particular, when I was helping clients post safe harbour entering into the standard contractual clauses, a lot of suppliers would try to amend this provision to try and make it very clear that actually they, they weren't going to allow anybody to come on site and audit them, but actually the controller would have to be happy with a third party data security audit report or something like that. And I think there's a big question mark over whether or not this would be compliant. So I think this is a very tricky area for controllers and processors to try to navigate. Now, it is also worth commenting, I think, at this point, that towards the end of the relevant article in the regulation, it does say that the Commission may prescribe a standard form contract for intra-EEA controller to processor uh, agreements, and I would be very interested to see whether this actually comes to fruition. I think it would give us a better feel for how the authorities expect these types of agreements to look. Now, the only other issue that I want to mention about the data processor contract that I think data controllers need to be aware of, and this isn't particularly um, particular to GDPR, is that so often data processors seem to want to use the data that they're processing on your behalf for their own analytics purposes. And the concern here is that the processors could, at this point, turn into data controllers, which, as Hannah's already discussed, can muddy the water quite a lot. And therefore, I think it's very important to have these conversations very early on. If uh, you're amending the contract with your processor, perhaps 
you can explicitly say that the, the processor is prohibited from using data in an anonymous or aggregated format, that will soon bring the issue to the surface if indeed it does exist. But of course the contract is only one uh, part of the puzzle for control and stealing with data processors and Robert is going to expand a little further on this now. Okay, so practical considerations um, that I think the controllers should consider now, to be honest, uh, if not uh, when GDPR comes in. And the reason I say now um, is that you don't negotiate contracts within a matter of weeks. And you've got contracts as controllers already in place with long-established relationship processors who no doubt you want to continue to use and no doubt they want your business as well. And I think the process should be starting now so that when you hit the 25th of May next year, you're also hitting the ground running because there is no, there's no grace period. Um, we either have GDPR or we don't. And so if I was a controller, I would be starting to look uh, at all of the contracts that are in place with the third parties that you are using who touch upon your personal data. And whilst I haven't put it on the slide, sometimes we tend to think of the processors as being cloud providers, uh, the likes of the sales forces and the PeopleSoft and the Concurs and so on. But think about some of the other people that do things with your personal data, like your translation agency that you ask to translate documents that contain personal data into multiple languages. Uh, think about the calls, basic call centers. Uh, think about maybe your auditors, uh, those that are hosting deal room technology. There is actually a huge number of people that fall into the processor category and I would be thinking Let's look at what currently are the data flows that go between us and that processor and their sub-processor if we actually know who their sub-processor is, and of course you probably should do. And are we talking about personal data? Are we talking about sensitive personal data? Are we talking about categories of special data for GDPR that aren't even caught yet but will be? Uh, where is that data going? Do we just assume it's sitting on a server in the US because that's where the processor is headquartered or is it being mirrored in some other country? What are we going to do if some of the data is held on a server in somewhere like Russia where there are restrictions on how the data is then managed and exported? What are our processors IT policies and procedures? Do they have ISO 27001 for example? Do they have a history of incidents? Are we trading with somebody that already is toxic? Um, and that's incidents notified or not. I think we're now starting to think, is this somebody we want to be in business with, given all the things that Hannah talked about earlier in terms of, of whether a processor should or can accept unlimited liability, etc. Uh, has the processor been audited by a data protection authority, either voluntarily or otherwise? Do we know who their data protection officer is or whatever their title is, the person that's responsible for compliance? Uh, do they claim any ownership of personal data? Is there anything in the master service agreement that says, by the way, when we are acting as your processor, we may also use some of the data that we're managing for our own purposes or not? Are they actually tripping into a controller type scenario? What are their policies like over retention and destruction? Uh, what contractual or other controls do they have in place with their sub-processor? Uh, I'd also be looking inwards as well and saying, well, all of those questions we're going to ask of our processor, should we be asking ourselves how good are we before we go out and demand X, Y, and Z? in negotiations from the processor because if uh, 
Hannah is right and the processor is going to say, I want mutual warranties, I want mutual indemnities, what risk are you carrying as the controller? Uh, what are all of the policies and procedures that you've got or should have in place, like your own retention and destruction, your own breach response policy and procedure? How do you flow down to the processor everything that you have to do as the controller, bearing in mind that notwithstanding what GDPR says, I think the buck still stops firmly and squarely with the controller. Um, have we thought about the staff that we use, but also our processor uses? What, what do we know about the level of checks that the processor and their sub-processor have in place for the individuals that are likely to be the root cause of the breach or the disappearance of the data, etc.? Uh, we've seen that happening in practice on, on some of the work that we've done in, in the past where a a perfectly good quality processor is still the cause of the issue because one of their sub-processors staff walks away with a very large memory stick with an awful lot of sensitive data on it. And what training programs do we as the controller have and should we be insisting on training standards for the processors and sub-processors that we're going to engage with long time? Um, before I move on to the next slide, uh, while Hannah was speaking, a question came in, and you haven't even had a chance to look at it yet, but fairly or unfairly, I'm going to throw it out and throw it back at me if you don't want to answer it, but we have had a question that said, if people are pricing their systems and services now that are intended to have a life beyond GDPR uh, go-live date, um, should they be insisting on PIAs now? Should, should processors and controllers be using PIAs as a, a standard now, do you think? Um, I think they are incredibly useful, PIAs. I think that at least now, the great, I mean, in the next year, well, I'm trying to do the maths on the calendar, how long have we got now? Uh, 14 months or whatever it is. Uh, I think that the great thing about doing a PIA now is you have a lot more flexibility about what that really means. And so, you know, you could do a PIA which might just be on the, you know, back, back of a fag packet at least. But I do think it's definitely worth thinking about anything that you do now and what you think the risk of that is. You know, particularly if you're, you know, if you're building any systems or anything like that, you're selling any product, I think it is definitely worth, it's worth thinking about what contractual liabilities you're taking on, but also, you know, just generally, are you designing actually something that is quite a high, a risky product? And therefore, I think you need to think about that. Now, that doesn't mean you have to create a document that says privacy impact assessment and, you know, put all your categories and boxes, but it means that you certainly, I think it's very much worth thinking about and doing an assessment of some description. Okay, and I ask that now because it neatly leads into what the processor should be thinking about, but if again we look at what the controller is likely to ask the processor um, and the liability that the processor is taking on, um, if I look at the question that we've just had about future-proofing your services as a processor, it might of course lead you to change your pricing structure because you're now in a different game from what you've previously been in, and I think controllers should anticipate some interesting negotiations and new offerings, etc., that will adjust the cost versus the balance of liability and risk. So if I was a processor now, knowing what's coming down the track, I certainly would want to be carrying out a compliance assessment to ask, to look inwards and say, are we fit for purpose for the service and the pricing that we're going to be offering when GDPR comes in. What do we need to rewrite, if anything, in our terms of business? And certainly one of the rewritings might be to anticipate all those concerns that the controller is going to have and positively sell the fact that you do comply with the standards and make that a differentiator between you and your competitor. So there's an awful lot here where I would be going out and selling to the controller, Mr. Controller, we understand your concerns and that's why we've already put in place 
these checks and balances, this new uh, processor to processor BCR, all of those things that could be positively sold. And we'll come back to certifications and so on. Hannah, do you want to jump in? I was in? just going to say, I think another advantage of that is it's great if you can get out with your paper right away. There's no, there's a, you know, it's so much easier instead of pretending that GDPR is not happening and just saying if we can get away with better terms, you know, with non-GDPR terms, we should. But then you know, there is a risk the customer just turns around and says, right, you can have ours, and it's got apps, it's got the worst language you could possibly hope for with an unlimited right of dawn raid audit in the middle of the night sort of thing. Whereas if you get out there and you say these terms are compliant, you've got a lot more scope to have something that, yep. you know, is a bit more suitable for your business. Yeah. And I suppose loads of processors use other processors. So everything that, again, you're, I'm saying to you as a processor, you need to turn around and say, what should we be doing as a processor in terms of other processors that we engage with? Um, audit the sub-processors. And then insurance. Um, insurance in this area is a moving feast. And I literally had some advice from a specialist in the area today that's been looking at our clients' insurance for cyber risk and privacy liability on a global basis, who said you've got four different policies as a business and they conflict with each other and some of them on the face of it look awesome until you look at the exceptions and find that you actually have no cover realistically at all. So I would be going back out and thinking what is it that we need to uh, plug the gaps between what we can contractually control and what we can't. Um, and I know that controllers will be asking questions of processors. What is your insurance policy? What's If you're going to limit your liability, um, what are you limiting it to? And if you're capping it with your insurance, do we think that that is a policy that's worth the paper it is or it isn't written on? And then, of course, there is how do we manage the data transfer solutions where the data is moving in a million directions? Uh, is Privacy Shield the answer? Uh, are model contracts or standard contractual clauses the answer? Or do we need a hybrid solution of all of the variations that I'll show you in a minute on the next slide? And also, I guess you have to ask yourself as a processor, at what point do we stop being a processor and become a controller? Or does it actually make any difference at all? And maybe do we actually start planning for the, for the gold standard approach, saying it doesn't matter what we call ourselves, it's ma it matters what we contractually say or take on. Look at your policies and procedures. Uh, we talked about processors having a DPO in certain circumstances. Um, do you have to have a DPO? And if you don't, but you choose voluntarily to have somebody, should you call them a DPO, a data protection officer, or should you call them something else so that you don't trigger all of the liabilities that attach when you appoint a data protection officer? And I've said this several times, and Hannah's just reinforced it, I would be anticipating the customer controller needs now and also make sure that all these wonderful policies and procedures are actually rolled out to your staff and that you show an audit trail that the staff actually know where the policies are and have been trained to the policies and you have a system of knowing when the new policy is updated and so on because being the lawyer I'm bound to say you need to plan for when the worst happens so that you can look your customer in the face and the regulator in the face and say yes it went wrong but we were moving in the right direction. So finally, uh, certifications and codes. Well, um, I'm going to whiz through the first few because we've talked about them and they're the subject of lots of other discussions that we'll have. But Safe Harbor's gone, we have Privacy Shield. Privacy Shield is still the source of debate, but now so are standard contractual clauses or model contracts, and now in Dublin, they are the subject of much debate as to whether they are as any good as, private, as Safe Harbor was. We are seeing a, a significant increase in the number of binding corporate rules, primarily for controller-to-controller -controller scenarios. I think there's now something like nearly a hundred of those out there. Um, 
and we're seeing an increase in processor binding corporate rules as a overarching or underpinning standard for all aspects of privacy compliance, not just data transfers. Consent is really not a realistic option for data transfers because when GDPR comes in, consent has to be as easily capable of being withdrawn as given. And how do you manage a situation where at any one second you have no right to be doing what you're doing? So we have two new concepts under GDPR. Codes of conduct, not dissimilar to binding corporate rules in a sense, and certifications or seals. So um, codes of conduct, there is already a good working example of a code of conduct under the directive, and that's the uh, FEDMA code of conduct, which must have been in existence for at least 10 years, and is the European Direct Marketing Association's code of conduct which all FEDMA members have to sign up to as a member and which has been run past the uh, Commission and past the DPAs in Europe and has been signed off as a suitable mechanism for compliance and data transfers. So you have to ask the question, if you look at what Microsoft, for example, is doing in terms of their cloud offering and cloud codes, as is the Cloud Industry Forum, will we see an increase in codes of conduct for sectors, for the insurance sector, for the banking sector, for the business intelligence sector, for the educational sector? I see no reason why that might be the case subject to competition law or antitrust type issues, but it's certainly one that is being looked at by a number of industrial sectors because GDPR calls that one out as an opportunity, though nobody is going to get that one put to bed and signed off within the time limits, and in any event we're still expecting more guidance post GDPR as to what the codes of conduct look like, but I know one sector that is already investigating that and saying the alternative might be that we go for a seal or a certification. The Keneal has had a privacy seal process in, while, uh, in place for some while, and I can think of one US uh, software vendor that has gone for a Keneal seal, excuse the rhyme, uh, but essentially to successfully bid for French government contract work because apparently the big seal or the big tick um, is something that government agencies in France are looking for. And so they've said whether we like it or not, we're going to do it because if we don't do it, we're not in the invitation to tender or we're not in the request for information. Um, and we don't have a UK seal yet, but the ICO is expected to announce the seal program during this year. And again, I can see that processors, if not controllers, might say in our marketplace and market space, being able to show somebody we are tendering to that we have voluntarily been assessed or audited by the regulator or by um, an auditing agency on behalf of the regulator who has said, yes, you tick all the boxes, therefore you can show that you have a seal, might be what differentiates you from the opposition. Uh, so there's still quite a lot of watch this space and as we hear more we'll talk about in our regular webinars uh, some of the news as it comes out in these areas. Um, we have one or two more questions that have come in um, and the first one I'm going to ask Janine, mm -hmm. um, can you say a bit more about who can be or should be a DPO? Data Protection Officer, please. Um, well, really the DPO can be somebody that's either internal, an existing employee within the business, or somebody that is an external service provider. I think regardless of whether you make an internal or external appointment, 
the DPO really is a pretty senior role. They have to report to management. So this has to be somebody who's able to cope with all those difficult questions at board level meetings and really has an in-depth knowledge not only of data protection law, but how data protection law operates and integrates with their business sector. Um, an interesting question that I've had recently is whether a law firm can operate as a data protection officer on an outsourced basis for a client. And I, I'm a bit on the fence with this one. And I would make comparisons to two of the EU jurisdictions where they have gone in opposite directions on this question. So in Germany, it's very normal for a law firm to act as the DPO for its uh, clients. In Poland, it's an absolute the absolute prohibition on it, it's just not allowed at all. So I'd be very interested to see how these differences around the European Union are reconciled. Okay, and I'm going to actually throw, Hannah can jump in, uh, but I'm going to ask this next question to Janine again. Um, if a processor has to um, appoint a data protection officer, mm -hmm. how does the controller stop that DPO reporting an incident or a non-compliance to its local supervisory authority because that's the risk and we see it with the German DPOs at the moment that they will go straight past management, go straight to the regulator and Hannah was talking about breaches need to be flowed, the, the notification goes up to the controller but what if the processor has got a DPO who goes that's my job, I'm going, I don't care well, about the, the contract. The data processor is required to notify, or the supplier, let's say, will be required to notify the authorities only of breaches where it is acting as a controller for that data, not okay. as data is processing on behalf of its customers. In that case, it would be surely in, in breach of the contractual obligations that it would have with its customer, I think. Do you want to do Hannah? Well, I was going to say, I think that would be a good thing to include in a contract. So it's quite common to see um, in more sort of public reporting situation. So as an A, it's quite common now to have a prohibition on a processor, say, making any public statements. You don't want them going out to the media and saying, we had a breach, ah, you know. So uh, that's, that's quite common to have that now. And so I think you could actually expand that to say, not only will you not make any public statements about this breach, you definitely won't contact our customers and you definitely won't contact the DPA without speaking, certainly without speaking to us. But I mean, I don't mm -hmm. see, you know, they're, they're unlikely to, uh, as a processor, I wouldn't accept a prohibition on me speaking to a regulator because I would want to manage my own risk. But you could potentially negotiate a limit on, you know, a, a requirement to consult or to not do it until you've at least told the controller or something. And I think another concern with processor breaches is, is that often if a processor has a breach it's going to affect several of its customers, possibly hundreds yeah. of thousands of its customers and therefore the obligations really need to be consistent across all of the contracts and I think there could be a lot of push and pull between controllers and, and the customers and the processors and between the customers about how the breach is handled and, and reported. Yeah. And, and we're nearly at the end of our time but I've got one more question which actually follows on. Um, and I'm praising what came in. Uh, if we've got an existing contract as a processor uh, with an uncapped liability for data loss um, and our contract term extends beyond May 2018, realistically, any thoughts on how we can negotiate a cap? Uh, so this is coming up quite a lot and this is where you go in there and you say, We've got to do this because we need compliant terms. It's our obligation to. We have to totally rethink this whole thing. We're going to need to do it. We're going to pre prepare you some beautiful GDPR compliant terms. This is your obligation to. It's really, really important that your contracts are all uh, compliant with GDPR. So we're going to give you a whole new set of terms. And at that point, it's much easier, therefore, to get that liability cap because, I mean, that is... I would say that is very important, you know, it's far, it's a far greater risk for you, I would say, as a processor to have an uncapped liability rather than having non-compliant terms. So actually, perhaps the impetus to update your terms isn't to do with updating your terms, it's to do with updating that liability and saying, you know what, because we're taking on all these additional obligations, because you are, because there's all these new obligations under the contract and statute, we are also going to have to rethink our liability.
Okay, so we've come to the end. Um, thank you for everybody for being on the webinar. Um, just to let you know, our next webinar is on the 16th of March, same time, same place. Uh, we're going to be doing a, a roundup of things that are interesting and relevant, uh, including uh, artificial intelligence and ethic and trust issues, what's happening in other parts of the world. Uh, we'll be posting that fairly shortly, probably next week. Already on our website is a, um, a specific webinar on the 30th of March, uh, very UK focused to be honest. Uh, we, with the Data Protection Network, are doing a round table discussion uh, on fundraising and charities and data protection and there was a conference this week in the UK where our information commissioner has been fairly outspoken about uh, that sector and how they need to comply with the law and be perhaps more transparent than they have been. There will be a recording of the webinar that will be available uh, for download. Um, we will also make available on our website a PDF of the slides. Uh, from me, Robert, uh, thank you to Jaina on the technology and to Hannah and Janine on the main body of the content. And we look forward to being with you on another occasion. Thanks. Bye-bye.